The media was in full propaganda mode for another UK war in the Middle East, even before Britain's NATO ally Turkey shot down Russian soldiers fighting ISIS. The chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, Crispin Blunt, to whom David Cameron replies in the coming hours in an unprecedented reaction to a Select Committee report, is on Saturday's Going Underground. Already, Cameron has given French bombers the use of Britain's base in Cyprus, from which to conduct bombing raids on Syria. But unlike Russia, France is bombing without President Assad's permission and in support of Syrian rebels. With me is one of the world's greatest journalists who knows better than most about the impact of imperial wars, from Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos to the British Labour Party's catastrophic wars on Afghanistan and Iraq, and to David Cameron's destruction of the richest country in Africa, Libya. His new film, American Power in the Asia Pacific, and its new challenge from China is out next year. John Pilger, thanks for coming back on Going Underground. So how are ISIS the progeny of Washington, London and Paris? Oh, they are the not only the progeny, they are the, the fully grown-up, uh, manic, uh, adolescent uh, creature belonging to uh, Paris, London, Obama, uh, and, and the United States. Without the support of these three countries, without the, the, the arms that have been given to ISIS, either they've been given directly uh, to uh, Jabhat al-Nusra and have gone to ISIS or they've gone the other way or they've gone to the Wahhabists in Saudi Arabia or in Qatar but the French, the British, the Americans and the Turks have all supplied those who have kept ISIS going. You know, if David Cameron had won his Commons vote a couple of years ago, ISIS would now be in charge in Syria. That, the, in other words, the Middle East's most um, multi-ethnic, multicultural state would be finished. And these fanatics would be in charge, and that would be thanks entirely to Western actions. Western actions that are reinforced by our propaganda. Propaganda is so powerful now. I've never known really a time when propaganda has played such uh, an important part. And that includes 2003, when propaganda allowed Blair to go ahead with Bush and invade Iraq. I mean, here we have the, 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 this orchestrated hysteria following the terrible events in Paris being reported so selectively so rapaciously, um, just now the Guardian has admitted that it suppressed comment that might suggest that Western policies were, had something at all to do with ISIS and the attacks on, on Paris. And we know that Cameron has ignored everything that Blair was told by <clears throat> all the intelligence and security agencies from MI6 all the way through. We had uh, the former ambassador, Oliver Miles, saying that, um, just reeling off all those, those, those government institutions that warned Blair that if he attacked Iraq, then it would come back, there would be blowback. Nothing um, less would inspire uh, young Muslims to go and, and fight on the side of the fanatics. Cameron knows all that. I mean, is this man serious? Is he a serious human being? That we, we really need to ask that. Or is he just um, this kind of uh, verbose soci sociopath as he comes across now as with his ludicrous policies. You quote in your updated article, which uh, harks mm. back to the bombing of Cambodia to explain events mm. today, you quote the former French Foreign Minister Roland Dumas saying that British officials in London were talking to him about Cameron's support for regime change, for destabilizing Syria. Mm. Would you appeal yeah. to someone to leak that information? He said he couldn't go into more detail because for fear of litigation himself. Yeah, well, that was 2013. Uh, Dumas, in, the, in an interview on French television, said that, that he was, uh, happened to be in England and he was invited in to see people in the government. 
and asked if he would like to take part in a project they had. And that project was an attack on Syria. Uh, but, you know, that's 2013. We can go back to the 1950s when the Br British intelligence was plotting the, the end of the regime in, uh, in Syria. Syria ha Syria's crime, Syria's main crime, is that it is independent and it stands against um, Israel dominating that part of the world. It stands with these days with Iran, it stands with uh, the other opponents, Hezbollah, now with Russia. There is no question that if there was an election tomorrow, all those minorities that look to this government in Damascus for all its violations of human rights, and no one doubts those, look to it as its protector, because the alternative is ISIS. And everything the West has done has been to create first the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, then with uh, the, the invasion of Iraq in 2003, then in 2011, the invasion and destruction of Libya, that probably was the crucial, that was the turning point. The French, the British, the Americans, less so in this adventure, was mainly the French and the British. Since then, Holland has sold, openly sold arms to Jabhat al-Nusra. The arms of uh, 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 French rocket launchers have, have ended up with, with ISIS. This year in April, it did a, a, a I think a seven, six, seven billion dollar deal with, for French jets with Qatar, and it did a, a 12 billion dollar deal in June with Saudi Arabia. But then I suppose I David mean, Cameron are, in the next few hours may be making the case that, okay, maybe those were mistakes, but you're an appeaser if you believe that the threat of bombs in British cities in response to a Syria bombing campaign should make us uh, avert our eyes and, and not bomb even at what we created. Well, that's a, you know as well as I know, I know why you have to ask it, but that, that's a sort of ludicrous... There'll be the argument. <laughs> that's a then, ludicrous then even Jeremy, suggestion. Jeremy Corbyn's uh, shadow cabinet members will be making this argument. Well, uh, Jeremy, the Labour Party have been almost as much a party to uh, this, this, uh, this horrendous state of affairs in, in the Middle East. I mean, the, the Maan News Agency have just published a day in the life of Palestine, all being ignored, with one Israeli crime after the other. We have in, in Israel, you know, what is effectively a lawless and terrorist state protected by uh, by Britain, by the United States, by France, and by the EU. The EU which does deals with Israeli arms companies. Uh, so much money has been made out of the suffering of people in the Middle East. Um, and those arms deals that the French have just done, just think about that. Put that against this rather strutting, plastic little Napoleon that Hollande has presented himself as in the last few days. We are at war. The Republic is at war. Well, sure, yeah, he's at war and he's supplying the wherewithal, the arms for that war for the very enemy that he, he, he denounces. This kind of double standard now, this hypocrisy has become so much part of our public life such an underpinning to so much media now that I think people are understanding much more than they're given credit for. Do you think that Washington, which has been helping PKK affiliates, uh, that happening on one side, Britain supposedly wanting to combat ISIS now, whilst being friendly with Turkey, shows that the NATO uh, alliance is finally in a, in a sort of terminal disarray? They certainly are intact enough to do an enormous amount of damage. Their last uh, uh, big adventure in Libya is probably the prime reason 
that there is so much uh, turmoil now and there is so much fanaticism. The Russians, uh, Putin, is, it seems to be one of the most serious people involved in the Middle East. He pointed out that uh, the, 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 the long lines of trucks, uh, to, uh, ISIS trucks that are stealing Syria's oil, haven't been bombed during, haven't been interdicted during the, the, the so-called Western war against ISIS. The Western war against ISIS has been a farce. While, while feeding the, the monster of the fanaticism through Jabhat al-Nusra, through ISIS, uh, apparently th through something called the Free Syrian Army, which, which as we now know doesn't exist, in effect doesn't exist. Well, let's go to the media now. Did it uh, surprise you how the Murdoch press reacted to Paris and seemed to do exactly what ISIS would have wanted uh, but journalists it's not, to but do? It's not only the Murdoch press. It's like saying in the United States, is it, is it surprising that the Fox News had behaved like Fox News? Well, in this country, the Murdoch press behaved like the Murdoch press. The Daily Mail behaves like the Daily Mail. We shouldn't be surprised. But now we have right across the board, and that includes serious papers, papers who claim to their readers that they have some gravity, some conscience, like The Guardian, being part of this orchestration this for the escalation of war in that part of the world. The, when The Guardian suppresses comment that... Uh, that, that it should be patently obvious to anybody that it is the West that has created this monster, this monster of killing and suffering and of, of dispossession in the Middle East. Do you think when, uh, I mean, a lot of Tony Blair's old friends, obviously, on the Guardian newspaper, we don't want to just pick on that paper, the Observer did, did support well, no the 2003 on, war. No, no one always suggests that there is a serious side to the press. That's, that's that pretension is very important to certain newspapers. It's a pretension very important to the BBC and it's very important to The Guardian. But the propaganda is even more lethal because it comes from sources of news that have credibility. Well, when Jeremy Corbyn presumably exterminates those remnants of the Blairite uh, Labour party that I suppose the accusations are guilty of war crimes. Mm -hmm. Will that change things in the media representation of wars? I don't know. I can't, I can't imagine personally, and I wish Jeremy Corbyn all the luck in the world, but I can't imagine the Labour Party changing. It's a warlike party, and it has been that. It has a number of people in its shadow cabinet who are just eager to bomb. It's a warlike party. Uh, the media has always played, has always beaten the drums of war. Uh, you had journalists, I made a film with journalists saying in it, uh, um, had, had it, had it not been, uh, had the, the lies about uh, Iraq being questioned, had Blair's lies been questioned instead of being amplified, then that war might not have happened. That certainly was true in America. You have very distinguished journalists who've said that, that had the propaganda not been allowed to run its course, that had journalists done their job and questioned the propaganda, challenged the propaganda, that war might not have happened. I'm not sure about that myself, but it's an interesting idea because, well, because you know, almost a million people died as a result of that invasion. And what about the divisions within society? I mean, the, the Sun headline, one in five Muslims would support ISIS, thus the kind of thing ISIS presumably would want to have create divisions. I don't believe divisions. anything in the Sun, really. But uh, yeah. when it comes to even no, refugee, I... the refugee crisis, as you say, on the BBC regularly we hear uh, yeah. kind of uh, attempts at trying to say we need a fortress Britain and it's the fault of refugees. Well, the fortress Britain uh, hasn't paid off. What can you do about somebody who, who decides to blow themselves up? Uh, there's almost no defence to that. So what you do is you go to the cause. 
because those bombs on the 7th of July 2005 were Blair's bombs that went off in London. So much of the, the suffering of, of people, um, the, the terrorist attacks and so on, can be brought back to actions taken at great remove in distance and culture by the leaders of Western governments. Going back to Afghanistan in, in the 1980s, when the architect of the creation of the Mujahideen as, a, as, a, a, as a, a, an organization built to overthrow the Soviet Union, basically, um, that was admitted by Brzezinski, Carter's national security advisor, who set it up. And we've seen this, this support for fanaticism, Islamic fanaticism, by Western governments, right, you can go further back, go back to the, the time when the Muslim Brotherhood, at its most fanatical, was given a place to organize in the offices of the Suez Canal Company, then con controlled by Britain. Read Mark Curtis's extraordinary book about this alliance between imperial Western governments and Muslim and the creation of Muslim fanaticism, while doing that, uh, demanding that the one uh, government that could stand up to them, that's in Damascus, be overthrown. Is the only beginning of a solution, you mentioned Palestine, for Britain to sever ties or whatever, do something about Israel-Palestine, uh, is that the way to outflank ISIS and its propaganda? We could have a wish list, couldn't we? You know, the wish list is, at the top of the wish list is there has to be a concerted effort, clearly, to, um, to stop the destruction of Syria, the final destruction. The second priority should be all the parties negotiating a way to deal with ISIS. I can't imagine that happening. Finally then, who wins out of this? Of course, today's the... Chancellor's autumn statement, uh, who, who is winning out of all this uh, turmoil? Well, the people who are killed in Paris are not winning, are they? And the people who are killed in Palestine are not will winning. And the people who were, were killed by ISIS in Beirut, who the media all but ignored, are not winning. So all those people who suffer and are maimed, all those 700,000 widows in Iraq, they're certainly not winning. It has to stop. And in my view, it will only stop when people force their governments to stop. Now, how that is done, I can't really say, but that certainly is the only solution that is left to us now. John Belger, thank you.